What is up, Flick fans, and welcome back to my channel. So recently we got a teaser for the brand new Christopher Nolan movie, Tenet. Well, at least we did in front of Hobbs and Shaw. It's not officially released online yet, but I have a feeling that is coming very soon. But as of right now, this moment, I want to talk to you guys about all of the movies under the Christopher Nolan banner. We're talking all 10 movies that he has directed. And if you're coming to this video hoping to find someone who is going to bash the name of Chris Nolan, I have to be flat honest with you at the beginning of this video. He is, if not my favorite director, then my second favorite director. It's constant fighting between he and Denis Villeneuve, and they both have movies coming out next year that will probably face off for my most anticipated of 2020. So I am so excited to just sit back, relax, and talk Christopher Nolan movies today. I have a few opinions that not everyone is going to agree with, but that's the beauty with these tier lists. I love doing them, they're fun. And I need your tier list, your comments, and your rankings down below because at the end of this video, I am going to be taking all of the movies that I had just talked about and put them in the order of my most favorite to my least favorite movies of one of my favorite directors of all time in Christopher Nolan. Once again, I love him, so if you don't love him, I apologize. And just so you guys know, I did go back and re-watch a few Christopher Nolan movies over the last few days that I hadn't watched in quite a while. Those movies being Memento, Insomnia, and the very first movie we are talking about, Following. That's right. What? What? What is following? That's a Christopher Nolan movie? Yes. This is a very short film. It's only about an hour and nine minutes. It's Christopher Nolan's very first movie. Extremely low budget, shot in black and white, a very different aspect ratio if you haven't been watching A24 lately. Uh, it's an interesting movie. It really is. It's one that, you know, when I think of Christopher Nolan, I don't think of following, mostly because before he became this big budget blockbuster director, you had to start somewhere. This is where he started. And don't get me wrong, this is an interesting story with a few twists in there. And the basic premise is it's all about a guy who is following a select group of people. But as the film progresses, it starts to get more complicated. And by the end of the movie, there is something in there that should make you sit back and go, you know what? That was creative. I see why he made this movie. It's a bit slow. It's a bit long. It's before Nolan developed his Nolanisms. And if you're not a fan, then you may like this movie more. If you are a fan like I am, I was missing out on a few of those things. Once again, I can't dock the movie too hard because you should have seen the budget that he had to work with. It was nothing compared to other Hollywood films of the time, but he had to start at this point. And this for me was a really solid attempt. And I still think it was a good attempt. I enjoyed watching this movie yesterday is when I watched it. It was my first time uh, ever. It's the only Christopher Nolan movie I had never watched. I was not expecting much. I got a bit more than I was expecting. I still think it's a bit too slow and not as interesting as his other films, but I'm still going to place following on the good tier because for the budget he had to work with, it was still pretty impressive. Next up is Memento. Now, I had to go back and watch Memento, even though I have seen it two or three times. I'm like, listen, this is one of those movies you can watch it five times and still not completely understand where the plot takes you, where you start out, where you end up, and how you kind of meet in the middle. And if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is the narrative structure of the early 2000s that I look back upon and say it's probably one of the more interesting of the time. I look back upon the impact of the movie and not necessarily when it first released, but the more we have progressed as a society and a movie loving society, the more we look back on Memento and say, wow, it really did change the game. Kind of like how Tarantino came out with Pulp Fiction and did something different with the narrative structure of a movie. This wasn't just something different. This is something we have never even seen a movie come close to before. Starting out at the end of the movie and then taking us to the beginning of the movie and working our way towards the middle. The use of black and white and color is brilliant. I still don't completely understand aspects of the movie and I've even watched the 20 minute video of Nolan standing there at a chalkboard explaining this, it wasn't 20 minutes, but he literally explains the structure and why that particular structure works for this story and I completely agree. If this was a story that was told normally, I don't know if it would have been as interesting. You still have the powerhouse performance from Guy Pierce and the fact that the film is just, it's fascinating. It truly is fascinating. Now, it is one that I did visit a bit after I started to fall in love with Nolan. I watched the Batman movies and in Inception prior to Memento, and then I go back and watch Memento, and I'm like, yeah, no wonder people already love the name of Nolan. This is, in my opinion, his best script, 
probably his best dialogue and overall story. It's not the most interesting, but it is still told in absolutely the most interesting way. And that's why I am placing Memento on the amazing tier because I just believe this is amazing work. You may be asking yourself, didn't this used to be called the awesome tier? Well, I just, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to respect the work of Christopher Nolan in this video, so I called it amazing. Just, I think he's an amazing director. That and the fact that I typed amazing and should have put awesome. Okay, now we move on to Insomnia. Now, Insomnia is the other one that I went back and revisited just because it had been a while. And what I remember from this film, two things really, is the performances from Pacino and Robin Williams, who doesn't show up until later on in the movie. I was surprised to see how late he actually shows up in this film and then does his dirty work and does it in a brilliant way. And two, the similarities to other movies that aren't Nolan movies, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. One, because this is a remake of another film, a film that I haven't watched, but it does harken back to other things in the genre. And two, it really is just, it's a simple story. It's a story with action in there, but not too much action. This is really a character piece focused on Al Pacino's character, and he gets the chance to do exactly what I believe the man was born to do, and that is give a powerhouse performance. This is one of the better performances I've ever seen in a Christopher Nolan movie. He's broken, he's beaten down, and by the end of the film, even though he didn't necessarily mean to do what he did, and if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about, he starts to believe that, well, maybe I did mean to do it. I don't know what to believe anymore. He is really a broken character, and it's a difficult thing to watch. The character progression is in incredible between he and all of the characters. I think Hilary Swank is also really good in this movie. Now, the movie itself, the plot, the structure, the format, everything about it, it's good. And if you look at it as its own standalone thing, it's like, yeah, it's a really good movie. I'm putting nothing past it. But compared to Nolan's other movies, I feel like it just, it falls a bit short when you're comparing. And I don't mean to sit back and compare, but this is a tier list and that's what I'm doing here. Now, I've been torn between whether or not I should put it on the good tier or the great tier, because like I said, still on its own, I think it's really good. Right now, I'm going to put it on good. I'm not gonna quite get it to great, even though the performances are absolutely fantastic. And if someone wants to put this high up on their Nolan list, I couldn't necessarily blame them. The next movie we're talking about is Batman Begins, and let's just get this out of the way. I love this movie. For a while, I was scared of this movie. Why do you say that? Well, when I was uh, 10 years old, this movie came out in theaters, and this was not the Batman that I was used to. I was used to the Joel Schumacher Batman world, and that world was not a world we want to be living in. Uh, but I was a kid, you know? And then I look back on it, and I slowly start to watch the movie more and more, and I realize how brilliant of an origin story this actually was, how grounded the story itself is, something that I think comic book fans took them a bit to get on board with, but once they understood what they were in for with these movies, from then on out, they got it, and they loved it. And I think Batman Begins is really the origin story, both literally and figuratively, for all of this, and it really was the start of when I first started to see, or asking the question, who directed this movie? Christopher Nolan, who is that guy? Well, that guy went on to become one of my favorite directors of all time, and a lot of that started with me the movie Batman Begins, because I believe this was actually the first Nolan movie I ever watched. I think that's the case. Regardless, Batman Begins, what it did is amazing. The villains are fantastic. Liam Neeson, uh, the character of Scarecrow. I mean, everything about this movie works for me. The only thing that doesn't work is Katie Holmes, her performance. I say this all the time. And not good. But they did recast her in The Dark Knight, so that was good. Next up, we're talking The Prestige, and I don't mean to sound like a fanboy here, and I've seen the, the term thrown around on Twitter, ah, you, you're a Nolan fanboy, huh? You're a Nolanite. You're a guy that just thinks everything the guy pushes out is gold. <laughs> I love the movie. I love The Prestige. I think it's great. It's not one that I started out watching over and over immediately. It took me a while to warm up, but over the last probably three or four years, I went back and revisited The Prestige, possibly more than I have any of his other movies, just because it has started to become so intriguing and fascinating to me. And you're going to see in a few minutes when I rank these movies, whatever comes in like fourth or fifth place, it's a movie that I love with all of my heart, but this is just how great and game-changing of a director he is. The Prestige is one of those movies that just holds Christian Bale 
Hugh Jackman's best performance, one of Christian Bale's best performance, because we have to remember the guy is constantly killing it in the movie world, but they're playing very different versions of what you expect them to play. And they're so good at it in the movie. The mystery, the intrigue, the use of magic in the film is great, but then the plot twist, when, when you realize what is actually happening, oh my god, there's two of them, and then you get into the story, the layers start to get peeled back, and you're just fascinated, in awe, really, with what they came up with for this movie. And the crisp direction from Christopher Nolan is another one. And this is probably one of those films, it holds four or five shots in here, full of amazing color correction, and, and the shot selection is just brilliant. But four or five shots that just stick out in my mind as some of the best shots that Nolan has ever composed come up with. The cinematography is gorgeous, the score is outstanding, the prestige is an amazing movie, in my opinion. Next up is Dunkirk. Now, Dunkirk is a divisive one. It really is. It's not a movie that everybody loved when it came out. It's not a movie that everyone loves today. It really is one of those stories that took me a bit to understand why I believe it is an amazing movie. Ah, here he goes again. Put another Nolan movie on the amazing tier. Listen, what can I say? Dunkirk, the theatrical experience was phenomenal, fantastic. I understand what Nolan means when he says you have to see this in a theater. That's why he puts Tenet, the, the teaser out there in movie theaters, does not drop it online because he truly believes in the theatrical experience. With a movie like this, I get it. Dunkirk is made to be watched in the theater because, and here's the best part of the movie for me, the sound design the score, and the integration of all of those things. When you look at filmmaking, narrative is important. Story is everything. Structure, you have to uh, judge it highly off of all of those things. But you also have to integrate the technical aspects. Sound design, sound effect. There are reasons why there are Oscars for all of those categories, right? Well, the way that those played into this story enhanced the story. It's one of those stories that you look at and you're like, well, who's the main character? There is not really a main character. And with a war film, I feel like you almost always have to have someone to gravitate towards. In this story, there are multiple, but it really is off-putting, especially with something like Dunkirk. You almost have to have that character that you can latch on to at the beginning and almost never let go. Nolan, once again, changing the game in terms of narrative structure. The aspect of the different time zones, all of these events happening in three select periods of time and all coming together at the end. That's a completely different conversation, and that's another reason why I think this movie is brilliant. But it's all to me about the combination of everything, and you latch on to the characters because of the story and how important the feeling that you're getting while watching this all going down on screen is. It's something that, you know, directors can rarely evoke, and for me, it worked. It didn't work for everyone. Like I said, if you're wanting a character to gravitate towards, you're not going to get that with this movie, and it's going to bum some people out, and it absolutely did at the time, and if you don't love this film, I understand that, but I found Dunkirk to be a mesmerizing experience, and I went back and I watched it two more times, and I actually liked the story more those two times compared to the story in the theater, but the theatrical experience is one of the reasons why I think it's an amazing movie. It's a fascinating movie. It's one that I could dive deep into and talk about all day, but we're going to talk about a different one. We're going to talk about Interstellar, Murph. Interstellar. Gonna ride my spaceship all the way into space because it's love, man. It's love. And I know you're thinking to yourself right now, uh, please don't tell me he's gonna put this on the amazing tier. Uh, da, da, da. I'm gonna put it on the amazing tier. Okay, he's lost his mind. He's a Nolan fanboy. If you would have asked me after the first time I watched Interstellar, heck, the first two times, do you think this is an amazing movie? I would have said, no, I think it's great you know, for what it was, but it does kind of fall off towards the end and the whole thing of love saves the day. You know, that aspect of the movie had me, you know, wishy-washy. I wasn't secure in my opinion, but gosh darn it. I went back and watched the movie about three more times, and every single time I watched it, I just got more and more out of it. And this is one of those films that gets better with age. It ages like a fine wine. And I look back on Interstellar, and I think one of two things. One, you know, it's a movie that brings out all of the emotions, but is it emotionally manipulative because of certain scenes in the film? One in particular where McConaughey is crying over his children who have aged. Yeah, that's going to get anyone. Even though you may not be loving the movie as it's progressing, it's going to get you emotional. Why is this story affecting me so much? How is, is this a movie that I can put on the amazing tier, even though when I first watched it, I had plenty of issues? Well, it's a film that did things 
differently than what I was expecting. And sometimes you go into a movie, you expect one thing, you get something totally different, and you're a bit bummed out. Not to say I was bummed out after I watched Interstellar, but I had issues with the story. But the more I watch the movie, like I said, the more that the story impacts me, and the more that I understand the logic of why Nolan went in this direction and what was really going through his head when he was talking about all of these things. Now, the science that goes into this movie, that's not one thing I can give any kind of credence towards. Now, I've heard a lot of people say it's extremely accurate and the concept, the idea of a black hole is something that really you can do anything with in a story like this. And that's one reason why I give Nolan a bit of a pass with where the story goes at the end. But I have heard that it is fairly accurate. You mix that with the performances and the story and the structure, not a wonky structure like Memento in a good way, of course, but not a structure like that. It is a well-oiled machine of a movie. It has incredible special effects. Once again, back to the sound design, it is brilliant. And then score, Hans Zimmer's score, I just... I think about it, I get chills. There are a few scenes in here that are some of the more memorable scenes I've ever seen in a sci-fi movie, and it's just grand, great, epic, original sci-fi with a performance from Matthew McConaughey that I truly love and respect at this point. And that is why Interstellar is on the amazing tier. And now we come to probably the single most divisive Christopher Nolan movie of all time, and that's the third movie in the Dark Knight trilogy, and it is one that a lot of people are going to get onto me for putting as high as I do. Am I putting it on the amazing tier? No. But, just, I, I want you to try to understand where I'm coming from, because I, I can already see it now. I did my MCU uh, tier list of strength this last weekend, and some of the comments, I'm just sitting back going, what? It's all just fun, and this... This ain't fun, it's calling me the bad words. Listen, I grew up with, I sound like Chris Stuckman, I grew up with the Dark Knight franchise. I did, like I said, Batman Begins, watched it young, started to appreciate it as I got older, the Dark Knight. We'll talk about that movie when I get to it. And you know, even those few scenes towards the end, it's like, how did Bruce Wayne get back into Gotham? My response to that is, well, he's Batman. Batman can do anything. Why is everybody not going to die of the nuclear coming from the, okay, listen. It's a comic book movie, Suspension of Disbelief. Now, it is a bit more difficult to suspend that belief because it wasn't established prior to it happening in the movie. So once again, it's a complaint that I understand, and it really is a critique that I have with the movie. But it doesn't overshadow what I love about the film, especially in the first two acts. And it all comes down to, for me, Tom Hardy's performance as Bane, a broken Bruce Wayne, who is in the movie way more than Batman, but I like that for this movie because I like where the story took us, and it really is a story all about rising from the ashes, coming out from the darkness, getting out of this place that you have been in for such a long time. You see the fallout with Alfred. You see there are so many emotional moments in this movie, and I think about them. I get heartbroken, and then at the end of the film, that final two-minute sequence with the music swelling up and Hans Zimmer's score and everything about it, you just you can't help but to feel a love for this character that you hadn't felt prior. Now, of course, we've always loved Batman, but it's a different kind of love at this point. It's an admiration, it's an appreciation, because you know it's about to come to an end, and then Joseph Gordon-Levitt rises, and that's the end of this movie, that's the end of this trilogy. And it really is something as a 17-year-old kid, my childhood completing itself at that point, and it's a trilogy that I grew up with, and I watched this movie four or five times in the theater. Now, as I got into critiquing film, I did start to notice the flaws a bit more, of course, but everybody has that movie that you just can't help but love. This is one of those films for me. I have multiple, but I can't deny the epicness of The Dark Knight Rises, and that's why I believe it's a great movie. And now we come down to um, The Dark Knight and Inception. I'm going to clump them into one, and the reason why I do that is because I have another tier. We have the amazing tier, and that covers all of the Nolan movies that I think are absolutely amazing. And a few of these will end up in my top 100 movies of all time. But there are only two of these movies that are in my top 25 movies of all time. All time. And that's why they're on the all-time tier. And I'm putting The Dark Knight and Inception on the all-time tier because they are two of my all-time favorite 
movies. Now, let's start with The Dark Knight, and there's really no need for me to explain why, how much I love this movie, but I'll just hit on a few things. Listen, I, once again, I'm a massive fan of the character of the Joker, and to see an interpretation like this, one that I never could have imagined in a million years, but one that scared the daylights out of me and brought out one of the best performances, probably my favorite performance of all time, it's just... It's fascinating to see what Heath Ledger did with this role. Now, a lot of people want to argue it's a Joker movie. It's not a Batman movie. That makes it a bad movie. I don't think that makes it a bad movie at all. I think that makes it an even better movie because while Joker steals the show, the focus is still on Batman. And I do think Batman has a large and incredibly major presence in this film and everything that he goes through, his trials, the turmoil as a character it's just great writing. It's great writing. It's great character development. And there are so many interlacing storylines here that could have come off as overly convoluting the plot, but it never does. It never does. And you experience exactly what Bruce Wayne is experiencing in this movie. And even Aaron Eckhart as Two-Face. I've been hearing more and more people kind of jump on the bandwagon of, oh, well, his storyline took away from the movie and it's not that good. But I disagree entirely. I think his storyline is possibly one of the best because it's all about a guy who fell into the darkness and never recovered. A guy who believed he was the hero at the beginning and like he says in the movie, turns into the villain. And that's something that really fascinates me. And now those are just a few of the reasons why this is one of my favorite movies of all time, along with Inception, which is another one. A completely different experience though, because Inception, the first time I watched it, walking out of the theater, we're all like, what was that? And then you think about it and you watch it again and you watch it again and you watch it, what, eight more times after that and you just fall in love with the movie. Or I did anyways. Listen, everything about this movie works for me. The story, the characters, I mean, the performances from Tom Hardy, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, everyone is so good in this film. And it's ridiculous the fact that they have this cast and they have this complicated and ridiculous, like I said, story and everything works so perfectly, and regardless of how many dreams they go into and into and into, at one point I believe they're three or four layers deep in the dream world, and you're still kind of grasping, even though it did take me a bit to understand, but you're still understanding what the stakes are here, what they have to do, the time that they have left to do it, and the action is awesome. I still go back and I pull up on YouTube the hallway scene, the rotating hallway scene. Hans Zimmer's score is just immaculate, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt is really good in that scene, but everyone is good in this movie. Inception is one of those films, and the fact that you get such an ambiguous ending, yes, it upset a lot of people at the time, and it still kind of upsets me. I'm like, the only people that knows how this movie ended, and I always say this, Christopher Nolan, Leonardo DiCaprio, and God. I have my theories, I have my speculation, and the more I watch Inception, the more details I'm going to see, the more I'm going to change my opinion, but one thing that I will never change my opinion on is the fact that I love this movie so much, and it was the final movie on this list. I spent a lot of time. I'm so sorry for the length of this video, but we're not done yet. We still have to rank the movies and let's take a look at this list. All right, so we actually have to start out with one change. I am putting following at number 10, followed by insomnia at number nine, the dark Knight rises at number eight at number seven. We're going to switch some things up here as much as I love the prestige. And let me tell you, it's a hard competition between the prestige and interstellar, but honestly, I have watched Interstellar more. I, I enjoy re-watching that more, even though lately I've been watching The Prestige more, but overall, as a whole, I'm going to slightly put Interstellar above that. So Prestige comes in at number seven. Interstellar comes in at number six. Dunkirk is number five. At number four, this is another, oh man, this is another difficult one. I'm a comic book guy. You see the background behind me. I have to put Batman Begins barely over Memento. But Memento is another movie that I, I just need to watch more. I've watched Batman Begins so many more times. Doesn't mean it's a better movie, but we're talking favorites here, my favorites. And clearly I'm a comic book guy, so I have to put Batman Begins at number three. And that top part looks pretty good to me. Inception comes in at number two, and The Dark Knight is my favorite Christopher Nolan movie of all time. That's my list, guys. That is my ranking of my favorite Christopher Nolan films in honor of the non- 
online released Tenet trailer. Hopefully it comes online soon. Who knows? By the time this video comes out, it may be online. Uh, but I am so excited for that movie. I'm excited to see what your all's thoughts are on Christopher Nolan. How would you rank his movies? What tiers would you place them on? Do you, do you love the movies that I love? Do you hate the movies that I hate? You know, regardless of what comments I get down below. The ones that are genuine, well thought out, and these lists that I've been seeing on all of these tier videos, God, you guys are just awesome. There's no other way of putting it. You're blowing my mind and your responses and the reason why you're putting these movies at where you're putting them, that's the best part about your comments. So I appreciate all of those things. If you enjoyed this tier list, hit that thumbs up button and I will definitely do more. I'm gonna continue this series until the day that I die. You're the absolute best. So many movies dropping this week. <laughs> I mean a lot of movies. So that means a lot of reviews. I'll see you very soon.